Ε, να καλέσω την Κρατσιέλα Σμπερτόλη. Έμαθα ότι μαθαίνει ελληνικά και ότι θα μας μιλήσει, αν όχι σήμερα, σίγουρα την επόμενη φορά που θα έρθει στην Ελλάδα. Την ομιλία της θα την κάνει στα ελληνικά. Next time. Next time. Um, καλημέρα. Για ευχαριστώ uh, που με προσκαλέσατε. So, it's, it's a beginning. It's lifelong learning. I will, I will try to talk to you in Greek next time. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here, and especially in this magnificent place, uh, and to meet all of you and to hear what you have been doing. And please, can I take this opportunity to thank the translators? You're doing a wonderful job. I really was able to understand what everybody was saying. And it was very interesting. Um, I am here on behalf of the European Basic Skills Network, which you have heard a little bit about, since I am very conscious that we already should have been on the coffee break. I'm not going to tell you a lot about the EBSN, but uh, I am also privileged to be the moderator of the last session we have in the program, and I hope that I will have the opportunity to tell you much more about the things that I am passionate about. Um, until very recently, I was working at what is called now Skills Norway, but that some of you may have heard mentioned as VOX, which is uh, the Norwegian governmental agency for lifelong learning. I'm going to talk about basic skills only and about adults only, but I'm going to talk about cooperation and whatever I say about basic skills and adult education, I think applies to everything that we are working with, all of who, us who are here. So, let's see. There we are. The problem with cooperation is that it has become a mantra. It's so very easy to talk about it. But how do we operationalize it? We think, I mean, from what I have heard today here, you, you are really cooperating among sectors, among stakeholders, and there's a lot going on. But there's always more that needs to be done. And there are so many challenges because of the fact that we see reality from the point of view of our particular field and our particular responsibilities. Scandinavians have this feeling that they are extremely good at cooperating. It's in the nature of the culture. So when Norway, as the first country, went in into the OECD's program of a skill strategy. We didn't expect the results from the diagnostic report. The diagnostic report said the Norwegian educational and skills system is quite good, but there's a lack of cooperation, and there's a lack of a one-of-government <laughs> approach to the issue. So we also have a long time to go, to, a lot to work with. To operationalize real cooperation, I think we need first to look at attitudes, not only systems. There is something about the necessary intercultural awareness of the fact that the educational system speaks another language than the public employment services although they are working with the same target group. We speak different languages because we see reality differently. And the first thing we need to do is to let go of this attitude of marking your area and marking your authority and not losing face and that sort of thing, which is challenging because we all feel, oh yeah, well, but if they come, they will say that. We know it already. We have a lot of preconceptions. Uh, we need to identify all relevant stakeholders. And it is often difficult. You will see in the next slide that I have made a mistake today and I forgot one very important stakeholder, and it is the place we are in. And I didn't list it. Libraries are essential as stakeholders. And I forgot. I apologize. So we need to identify all stakeholders, 
we need to agree on roles and responsibilities. And very often, my experience from the European countries the network is represented in, is that there is actually a fight for roles and a very unclear responsibility division, especially when we have to create new policy, when we create, have to develop. Who is going to take care of that? Are we thinking of where we are serving the target group the most? Or are we thinking of how we can protect our own institution? I mean, there's a lot of conscience searching needed here. And we need to cooperate at all levels, also internationally, even though we often feel, oh well, that country, we, we cannot learn from them because they are so different from us. I think we always can learn. So, who are the stakeholders, especially if we're thinking of the Upskilling Pathways Initiative, which is of the agenda, the initiative that is most interesting for the EBSN? It is, of course, the national authorities, it is the regional authorities, but it is also the local authorities. And I don't know enough about the system in Greece, but for us in Norway, just the division between national, regional, and local is difficult enough. Because, for instance, regional authorities have the responsibility for upper secondary education. Local authorities, the municipal authorities, have the responsibility for the primary and lower secondary education, which is the compulsory part. When it comes to basic skills, which incidentally is reading, writing, numeracy, but it's not about whether people are analphabets. It's about, it's much more, it's about whether they have what we call functional level of skills. And if you are talking about the functional level of skills, you may find, at least in Norway, I'm guessing it's the same here, you may find people at, uh, starting on upper secondary or on vocational training after compulsory who have enormous challenges when it comes to functional literacy and numeracy. And that's why it is essential, for instance, in Norway, when we are addressing basic skills, it's essential for the local municipal authorities working on basic education to cooperate with the regional authorities who have the responsibility for upper secondary. And let me tell you, it sounds easy. We do have challenges with that. How do you address the fact that there is a person needing more literacy training while studying at upper secondary? Who is going to give that training? You, that pragmatically speaking, it makes much more sense to include everything in one. Oh, but then you're stepping on the responsibility of another authority. That's why we need to cooperate. Social partners and workplace authorities are essential. Right. In, in, in this matter, you can hear that they come from a country with very little unemployment. But a very good way to start training people is at workplaces for older people, for adults, where they have a job, but they are in danger of losing it because they lack vocational qualifications. And the companies are developing and they are needing standards and these people may lose their jobs. They have the vocational training they need, they lack the qualification. And do you know what is stopping them from acquiring qualifications? They know a lot about carpentry, electricity, electric, as electricians or plumbers or whatever, but they don't have the basic skills needed to be able to read the theory write about it in an exam, have the digital competence needed to really work at that level. So we are, we are finding in Norway that a very good way of upskilling the workforce is to go to the companies, give the people, all the people, very often, the basic skills they need to get the qualification at work in a much shorter time than it would take to send them to a tech. 
I've learned something today. So it's, there are systems for putting all the needs and challenges together and find a shorter, more economical way. All first line contacts with the target group need training, need to be informed, need awareness raising to understand that the problem of this person may very well be that he hasn't automatized reading. He knows, apparently, how to read and write, but he cannot read and write well enough to acquire theoretical knowledge he needs. And we are training our uh, first-line workers in social services, in career guidance, to understand how to uh, identify the possibility that there is a basic skills lack here. So we need to cooperate all together to make sure that the target group gets what they need. And of course, all potential providers, both formal and non-formal. I have heard, if I have understood right today, you don't have a very well-developed non-formal educational <coughs> system. There are very good models out there, and those are the sort of thing that you can fetch from international cooperation. More about it later. Now, today we were talking with a friend here, a colleague, with, uh, about um, Greek words and the fact that we all have hundreds of Greek words in our European languages. One of them is synergy. And we're talking about cooperation. I know that synergy means cooperation, but in English, at least for me, Actually, it means more than cooperation. We, we talk about cooperation, and then when we talk about synergy, we have this feeling that we are creating five out of two plus two plus two. That synergy means not doing, not duplicating the job, uh, being very pragmatic about things, making things happen much easier, much quicker, because we are cooperating. It all works together for a target. And to create synergy, we need first and foremost information and real dialogue. As I was saying before, the change of attitude. Really getting together around the table, as we are doing today, and saying, what are our challenges, not protect protecting ourselves, <laughs> not trying not to lose face, but being open, trying to understand each other, trying to understand the different strengths and weaknesses of the different services, building real agreements, respecting diversity and respecting the different needs of the different sectors, and building capacity. And I have put here an example from Malta that I have just recently heard from within their uh, agenda program, they have created specific short and very directed courses about what needs to be done to upskill the workforce for company people. And basic skills are very much at the center of this. But to, to address company and uh, company people, union uh, people, uh, the, the leadership of, of big companies and tell them we are interested in doing this, and this is what it means for you, because companies are interested in the bottom line. This will mean that, as an example from Norway also, they tell us we need to upskill the workforce. The companies are actually much more interested in upskilling the people they already have than uh, having to throw them out and get people with qualifications. Now, upskilling the people in the company actually means that they can access a higher level, which creates a vacuum for unemployed people. And you, then companies and the workplace become part of the wheel that we are trying to create of skilling people constantly. It sounds a little bit like a dream, I know, but it can be done. Now, another thing we desperately need is more agreements on the issue. 
I don't know, when you talk about literacy, numeracy, digital competence in Greece, are we talking about a vague nebulosa? Or, or do we know what levels we're talking about? When we got in Norway the first OECD results about the skills of the adult population at about 2000, we got really frightened because it said that 10% of the population of the country didn't have functional literacy, functional basic skills. But at that time, we just thought about reading and writing as a vague thing. So we found that the first thing we needed to do was to say, okay, the three levels. At level one, reading, having the, the learning outcomes we were talking about before. The learning outcomes for level one means being able to do this and this and this and this. And for level two, it means doing this and this and this. And if we don't know what the issue is, how are we going to cooperate on courses? We found that some teachers said, oh, they need more reading. Okay, Ibsen. <laughs> I mean, they didn't understand the issue, so we had to train the teachers. We do have this framework. We created it in 2005 and 2006 in, in uh, Norway. It seems to work very well, and Luxembourg, the Ministry of Education in Luxembourg is also part of this network, of the EBSN, they more or less copied it. We say they adapted it. And, and we're very proud of that. The Luxembourg framework comes from the Norwegian one. It's on the web in English. If you need a framework, uh, so there, there you are. Um, we need a better knowledge of the target group. We need research. We need screens because the target group when we are talking about adult people, one of the main characteristics is that they are very, very heterogeneous. So we need different strategies for different people, different ways of meeting them. And for that, we need more research. We need very clear objectives so that we know when we have achieved something. And sometimes the objectives need to be moderate and modest, so that we can tell our politicians we actually have done what we said, because otherwise we're never going to meet them. So we need to be clear on what we want to achieve first and then go to step two and to step three. We need a clear division of roles so that we are not creating the will within the country many times. So maybe the, the employment services can take care of this particular target group but make sure that they keep in contact with these services taking care of another group because very probably they are going to find that they can reuse what they are creating. And we need governance and finance. One thing is that there are many stakeholders involved in this that have a lot of uh, know-how and the government doesn't need to create all the time, new services, new authorities, but the government needs to take control of what is happening and to have the overview and see what needs to be done. Now, when it comes to finance, this is always a very tricky uh, area to talk about. I'd just like to leave with you something I learned in Sweden. They said, we have systems, but obviously we need to create better synergy, we need to have new projects and so on. They created some national projects, but they made sure they were only financing, as they said, the glue that puts everything together. They financed meetings like this one. They financed dialogue projects, but they didn't want to finance the education, because if they finance something new with fresh money, when that project was over, there would be no more offer. So there's, there's a balance in financing what makes new things to appear, what creates more synergy, but making sure that it's really sustainable. 
Uh, that, it, that we can talk a whole day about that, so I better move on. And, but also very important, trust. That is something I really can say coming from Norway. And, sorry, I'm, I'm not Norwegian. That's why I can say that Norway is wonderful, because I'm not Norwegian, I'm Spanish, although I have worked 40 years in Norway. Uh, the Scandinavian <laughs> countries are wonderful when it comes to a trust culture. If we're going to have real partnerships between different sectors and make it possible to create courses offered by different types of sectors, we need a culture of trust. And I know, I have many Greek friends, I know it's difficult because here there is a bit of a culture of not being able to trust that what is documented is real and so on. But Create the trust first, and a lot will come after that, to my position. Now, we do have a very good example in Norway, which I always hesitate in uh, talking about. I have to hurry up, yeah. Uh, I can talk about it later, if you want, during the, the, the conversation, because this is a very good example, but it does depend on the fact that we have money. <laughs> now, when it comes to uh, cooperation, there are some examples I can talk about later, but I would like to emphasize the fact that if you cooperate between different sectors, you may be able to create bigger things. And there was talk today about the importance of digital tools. They are really something we need to focus on. They cost money, but if you cooperate between many sectors, you can create a big product that serves everybody. And there is the example from Germany, and ich will learn. <laughs> uh, apart from that, I know that Greece is not at the moment part of the electronic platform for adult learning in Europe, EPALE. But Cyprus is, and they are uploading and working in the Greek language. There is a lot that you can fetch from there. And within the European Basic Skills Network, we are now negotiating with the Commission for the new work plan. And 90% sure, we are going to create a capacity building series based on Nepali for different target groups among the stakeholders. So that you may very well be able to offer your people during 2018 a short course for local authorities on basic skills, a short course for employers and so on. So keep tuned and have had Thank you very much.